Welcome to another exciting episode of Scuttlebutt, the official podcast of the National Museum of the Surface Navy. Uh, we're doing a little bit of a remote recording here. We've got uh, Mike and Moran on the ship and myself remote, and we're joined also remote by Jose Hernandez, uh, self-described rigger at large from Midcoast, Maine. Uh, I like to say man about town, all around good guy, friend of the downtrodden, and uh, also worked on uh, Constitution. So welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Cool. We're all the mariners. We're all the, the, the people who weren't smart enough to get off the boat. Yeah. <laughs> smart enough to get off it or dumb enough to get on it to begin maybe, with, as maybe, the case so, may be. The right, right thing. You know, we all have a, a maritime background here. Um, and uh, frankly, since you're the guest, I'd love to hear a little bit of, of uh, Jose's background. I know you've worked on the USS Constitution, still a commission ship. Yes. I know you have a wealth of experience beyond that. You tie big knots. I, I tie big knots, I tie little knots, uh, <laughs> a variety of different things. Uh, what I like to say, as, as a rigger, you live and die by your knots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think it's very important, you know, uh, not just the decorative stuff. Um, but one of the things that I really enjoyed about, say, working on the Constitution is the fact that she's from the golden age of sail, where um, she was a rope rig. And so there was a lot of uh, artistry, a lot of fancy knot work inside connected as part of the, say, standing rigging or running rigging, you know, uh, a lot of things that were not only functional, but beautiful. Uh, That's what and, you've always taught me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, before I, I go any further into that, I suppose. So background, I started sailing uh, back when I was in college in the 80s, um, I started sailing on regular boats, yachty, plastic boats, as I call them now. Uh, and uh, so I did that for over like 10 years. And I would watch the L.A. Maritime uh, schooners, uh, the Bill of Rights and the Swift of Ipswich, sail in and out of L.A. Harbor there. And I thought, gee, I would so love to crew on something like that. And then I read in the local sail rag, the log, um, that it was a volunteer organization. And so that was it for me. I started. And uh, this, this was around just before the turn of the century, back in. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so um, I started there. And then shortly thereafter, uh, one of the volunteers gave this phenomenal rigging seminar uh, just on a weekend. But he really packed it. His name is Lindsey Philpot, and uh, I learned an awful lot from him. And that got the ball rolling. And I would show up any time that there was any rigging uh, to be done. Uh, you know, little things like patch serving or you know, uh, swaying up top mist or whatever, or crossing yards. You know, so uh, learned a lot from them. Um, and 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 some others. Uh, and then later on, Lammy. Um, I was working as a biologist at the time, and uh, um, when Lammy started building the brigantines, uh, I started volunteering half days there, uh, thanks to my boss at the lab, and uh, then uh, before you know it, they started paying me because I was there every day. I had all my tools, and I knew what I was doing, so they said, okay, we'll pay you, so that was like my first real professional rigging gig. And it kind of snowballed from there. So you worked all the nice country then the... on various ships. And, and maybe backing up for a moment for people who don't really understand what this means, you know, the, the rigging on a, a sailing vessel is, in fact, everything you see, all the ropes, yeah. the standing rigging, which holds up the mast, the running rigging, which runs the sails. And even though I'm an engineer, I know just a little bit about that. But um, there's an awful lot to that. There's a real science to it as well. Oh, I, absolutely. It's It's all applied physics. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a great, if, if physics classes had a tall ship as a lab, they would teach, more people would probably go into physics. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. And giant, giant vectored force problem, right? Exactly right, yes. Yeah. That's really cool. So all of us have some kind of maritime background. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> well, mine's more like, that's the same as Jose's. Yeah, I, just, I think... Uh, I had it in the back of my head when I maybe sailed small boats twice in my life. And uh, 
I all kinds of maritime books and movies and all of that. And then in 2003 or four, I saw Master and Commander and I was like, they actually filmed that on a square rigger. There's got to be a way I can do that. And I stumbled into Lammy LA Maritime Institute and uh, volunteered on the same brigantines. And Jose and I actually met, uh, I think it was early September of that year on a trip down to a tall ship festival in Dana Point. And he, That's right. yeah. Yeah, he was laying out a new bowsprit net and uh, splicing that underway. And I was like, that's cool stuff. And he sucked me in and <laughs> did a lot of rigging. So pretty much every everything I know about rigging, not everything, but the bulk of what I know and certainly the ethic I use in rigging, I got from Jose. So you've <laughs> sailed on both coasts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess you call it semi-professionally. You've been out there yeah. and we actually paid you. And, paid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really cool stuff. And David, you you actually sail on some, you, you have you a broad a range. Big in, boat. Yeah, from, from the big I, to the small. Yeah, I, when I was a kid, um, the the lake out the window here, I used to have a, a little El Toro. That's um, <clears throat> that's about the extent of my uh, of my actually powered by wind sailing. I had a, a little eight foot El Toro and I think a twelve foot Hobie Cat uh, Mono Cat. And but the um, the sailing that I have done is uh, actually on the vessel that Moran and um, Mike are on. That's where I started as a seventeen year old sailor. Uh, in the United States Navy. I also worked in engineering. Mike was an engineer. I worked obviously under our engineer. Uh, and it's always interesting for me to hear things uh, about the rigging being beautiful, about it being art as well as science, because you see that sometimes in uh, in other areas of engineering, boiler making and whatnot. Mm -hmm. It's always nice to see craft as well as function, yes. some real craftsmanship. So I did a couple of years on, uh, on the battleship and then I moved to... Um, to special boat unit 11 in Mare Island, uh, up in the middle part of the state, uh, San Francisco Bay area. And, uh, I did 11 years in, uh, an offshoot in Navy special warfare called, uh, special warfare combatant craft. So I have a couple of thousand hours in little green boats, uh, that go fast. As I like to say, God guns and fast boats. That used to be our motto. And, uh, I ended up retiring after uh, 22 years active in reserve in the Navy and, was uh, fat, dumb, and happy doing a completely different job in Silicon Valley when I got sucked back into the maritime world, at least on the fringe of it, by uh, by working here at the museum. I always love the fat, dumb, and happy thing. It's, we've all had that moment in life. <laughs> so, all right, and what's yours? <laughs> so, mine was kind of funny. My dad was a battleship sailor, grew up around boats, and and uh, helped uh, some people work on boats a little bit. I was a diesel mechanic originally before getting my engineering degree. Um, but but I had you know that inspiration from the National Geographic series. Remember wow. those? And can you can you do the song? You know, da, 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 da. <laughs> so <laughs> probably um, I just can't no, carry a tune. But yeah, no, 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 that, that's for sure in a bucket maybe. But uh, still, you know, I just love that kind of thing. And I I was able to go out on a, a small boat, uh, the Van Tuna. It was a research vessel at that point. It was originally owned by the owner of Van Camp Van de Camp uh, Tuna. It was his personal yacht like a 110 foot, you know, twin diesel. And it had been uh, converted uh, to a research vessel just for coastal work um, by Occidental College. And I went out with uh, my marine biology teacher, Rivian Landy, never forget her ever. Um, and I was just fascinated with that and, you know, just really inspired, it kind of fed an original inspiration. And, and so I remember talking to her, you know, on the boat and she goes, Mike, talk to him. And so I chatted with the engineer that day um, and didn't get anywhere initially, but ended up, um, it was right next to uh, other research vessels for USC. And then next thing I know, I'm up at Cal State Long Beach pursuing my degree. And uh, lo and behold, the RV Yellowfin, an 80 footer uh, twin diesel, of course, was looking for, um, I'll never forget this, temporary part-time intermittent help. <laughs> about as ten years as you can get. Fun. I know. It sounds <laughs> yeah. like what we need at the museum most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Basically, you know, there's no way you're going to get a real job here, but we need you. And and so they actually paid me. I want to say you know sixteen dollars an hour or something. And uh, you know, went down and interviewed. I, I had a diesel mechanic background. They were like going, "Oh, you'll take you in a heartbeat." So I ended up kind of tooling around uh, in the Southern California Bight. You know, basically from Point Conception and out 300 miles and down to the Mexican border, doing either undergraduate research or, or uh, um, we did some grad research we did actual fish and game work you know it was kind of fun uh, a little crazy at times um, and then and it was introduced to USC the school uh, who had 
uh, several vessels at that point, uh, anything from a 41 footer up to, they were converting a 220 footer um, from a, a tuna boat into a research vessel. And that was kind of the beginning. I, I I went down there and talked to the guy and, you know, had a drink with him, Don, I'll never forget him. And um, he, he offered me, he says, I, I pay my beginners from six to $8 an hour. And I said, I'll take eight. <laughs> and <laughs> and, and uh, so that was good. And, and, you know, that started off a almost six year career at USC, you know, across the, um, uh, the Pacific, um, did, did one trans-Pacific with them, flew to Kwajalein, flew to Guadalcanal, did, did some really fascinating things, but that job ended. But in the process, I was able to go and sit for my unlimited license. And so I ended up with an unlimited thirds. And the rest is kind of history. I ended up um, taking an odd year at the railroad. That's not maritime, obviously. I like trains, though, Jose. Um, and then, uh, and to be honest, so does David. But uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm yeah. surrounded. And I finally got the call from my main maritime uh, uh, mentor, George. Uh, main uh, main maritime grad and uh, from Banger, and he uh, he called me up and says, "Mike, I got a job for you." And so next thing I know, I I get a thousand days of sea time working on a I would call it a search and survey vessel. And I spent a year in the Med, a year in the Gulf. Uh, we did everything from we called it AFAB Marine, anything for a buck. Uh, <laughs> and uh, basically, you know, search and survey, pipeline surveys, um, seismic work for the the oil patch, as we call it. Um, and then we did um, underwater seismic work where we, we installed seismic systems and even did some R&D for some underwater cable laying. So that was an exciting job for me. Just loved it. And uh, some real sea time. You know, I was an, an engineer, obviously, but I spent a lot of time on deck. And uh, Jose, I've actually been up on the top of the mast here on this thing with you on the phone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember <laughs> where you guys yeah, were putting yeah. up the... Uh... So when when things oh, involve yeah. climbing and, and ropes and stuff like that, it's usually Moran and I out there on the either on the deck or up top, um, right. other than the mooring lines, of course, which the, the off scene handles. So, sorry, yeah. that, mine was a longer story. I didn't mean to do it that way. But... No, that's fine. By the way, uh, some other time off the, we should talk, because I've got connections to the USC through my wife, who uh, worked there in the marine biology department. So yeah. I worked for the Hancock Institute for Marine Studies back in, would have been the late 80s, early 90s. And, yeah. uh, actually, there's some wonderful history of research uh, with USC, <clears throat> with the Hancock Foundation, Alan Hancock was supporting mm -hmm. early qualitative or quantitative rather um, research down in the Galapagos. And back then it was kind of a, a yachty thing. They, he had a 110 foot personal yacht that was a quasi research vessel. And they even had a, a piano in the, uh, you know, in the wardroom, if you will. And, and they would yeah. have these little music sessions in the evening. It was very genteel. Uh, they would go down and do research during the day and then they'd sit around and drink and Play music at night so but, what a terrible life yeah i know it was, <laughs> uh, but really neat history there at usc a lot of it i think is is certainly changed if not truly gone but uh, mm -hmm. but it was wonderful experience for me wonderful because classing a vessel like that from an engineering perspective was fascinating it got me into the the, the world in, in a much deeper fashion and uh, my first trans-pacific was pretty extraordinary so really cool stuff neat so jose let's talk knots <laughs> Okay. That's not. That's well, not. You know, oh, you really? You just did that. Wow. <laughs> well, don't worry. There's going to be lots of uh, naughty yeah. jokes. Yes. Yeah. Bad puns, mostly. Slightly faster than one mile per hour. <laughs> <laughs> So we, uh, one of the, one of the reasons we pulled you in a few months back was because we have recently acquired the bosun's chair that brought FDR aboard the ship in 1943. Right. Yeah. And um, we hooked you up with our curator, Dave Way, because he needed to put a value on the chair to get it shipped out here. And we were like, how, OK, priceless. first of all, priceless. <laughs> but, you know, how do you put some sort of dollar amount on all the effort that went into that? And I'm just curious, what was your first thought when you saw the shots of that thing, the pictures of that thing? That was overwhelming. I mean, that there was a lot of work that went into that thing. It was very fancy. Uh, yeah. You know, definitely. Uh, worthy of the president, uh, FDR. You know, if anybody deserved a chair like that, it was him for sure. Yeah, you know, I'm looking at that, and you you kind of like go down the list. You know, fancy knots a heck of a lot better than I do, but there's just so much work that went into that thing. What could you give kind of an hour's estimate about about how long it might have taken? Oh, <laughs> I I don't know. I 
Yeah, I mean, at, at least 40. I, you know, there's wow. there's got to be more probably. Uh, but yeah, it, it was considerable amount of work. Uh, I, I'd have to look at it again, but <laughs> there was a lot going on on that chair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I guess one of the other things is what I've always loved about working with you is that you are you insist on high quality work, but the, the quality and the functionality of it is, you know, something that you ingrained in me a long time ago and you might've created a monster, but that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> monster. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, uh, why can't something functional be beautiful? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. And like I said, the, the golden age of sale has really proven that, um, uh, and not, not only, that with, with the functionality, but also um, that era, it was easy to repair the ship by tying knots. You know, uh, you're you're in a battle on the Constitution or whatever. You get some shrouds shot away. Well, you know, you loosen up your lanyards and you do a shroud knot, which is you know a wall knot on each side from the two uh, ends that are coming together, and then um, boom, you know. Your your ship's back together, and you're you can you're back in the fight without losing a mass, kind of thing, you know. Uh, so, what kinds of things were you finding on Constitution that you you know you talked about it with being art like well, art? the the rose lashings is a good example. Mm-hmm. You know, you use that um, uh, around, Oops. yeah. Um, and uh, one of the the major examples of that is called a mouse on a stay. So, like the main stay on the ship, the fore stay, uh, the mizzen stay, uh, and even the, the equivalent, the top stays. So um, you'd use, instead of what you have now, say with wire rope, you make an eye around the, the, the mast up at the hounds. Uh, do I need to explain some of that stuff for the listeners? Yeah, sure. All, all right, so- I'm following you, but nobody else is going <laughs> Yeah, so um, at at the top of the mast, you have an area where there's a a change in diameter. So it allows for the the rigging, the all the wire or the rope that's holding up the mast to stay. So you don't want it to slide down. If it was all just, you know, tapered like a pool cue, you know, that stuff would all just come sliding down to the deck and be absolutely useless. So you have something uh, which we uh call the hounds as the area where that change in diameter happens so anyway um nowadays you would have you know, on a modern stay that's made out of wire it goes around the back of the mast over the hounds it's spliced in place uh and that's it in the case where you have a uh, a mouse on a stay you have this lump that's created and then you do this fancy knot work um, grafting around it um, and that is a solid spot about I'd say two to three quarters of the way up the stay and past that coming around the mast again is uh, you've created another eye on the end and so what happens is uh, this is great for people on the radio. So um, <laughs> Lin- Lindsay was very eloquent. He could he could describe this stuff and you can imagine it right away, but uh, I, I'm not that gifted. So the idea is the, the end of the stay has an eye on it. And so that eye comes all the way up the stay and catches on that big lump you've created. And so it holds it from going any further and that creates the larger eye that goes around the hounds of the mast. And what's brilliant about that is for installing it is really easy and for taking it apart is really easy. Uh, The other thing is um, tension wise, um, on a regular eye going around the mast, you've got each leg of that eye carrying half the tension of that stay. So that's reduction. But in the situation where you have a, a, a mouse on a stay, <laughs> it's a good thing people can't see me because you know, I'm talking with my hands. Uh, 
you know, it's a Cuban thing. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> it comes around the back of the mast. And so that smaller eye is now, the tension on it is quartered based on That's what's cool. going on with the, you know. So um, it's it's better that way. And the other thing is in those older vessels, you were bringing topmasts up or swaying them down. Uh, and so you, you don't want to have to undo the stay. You, you know, yeah. you want to be able to just come down through it. So you, the mouse allows you to make a big enough eye that that whole topmast or to gallant mast or, you know, all of them can come down through it. Seriously? And, yeah. That's wow. Yeah. For that's those of, for those of, our listeners who don't understand, we're not talking about four-legged mouses. No, not at all. Or the kind that you use on your computer either. So. No, no, not at all. <laughs> either one of those. Um, that stuff is so shock. fascinating. Like, you wonder how we got away from it. I mean, you think people think it's more efficient or whatever, but that, in, in terms of moving spars around, that's actually a lot more efficient. Well, you know, it, 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 it was, but people don't move spars around as much as they used to, let's just this say. True. This is true. Uh, and didn't you do a bunch with, uh, you know, more modern materials to take some of the weight out of the rig when you put her back together? We did. We did some some Dyneema work. We did some Kevlar uh, stuff. I mean, like speaking specifically about Constitution, I, the majority of her rig is polyester uh, rope, you know, three strand polyester, four strand polyester. Um, and uh, it's there. There were some elements in the rig that were actually made out of wire rope and then hidden disguise. So, you know, kind of a la Disney. Um, so it wouldn't look out of place, uh, which in my opinion was a lot more work than is needed considering that with the polyester rig, she's a lot stronger <laughs> than she was as a hemp rope rig, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and she went around the world with a hemp rope rig plenty of times. So, you know, going crazy with Kevlar and these modern things is overkill. And unfortunately, also the the amount of tension you have to add because you have more elastic type materials, uh, you have to tension them up harder. And you know, she's an old girl, and she uh, she needs uh, more loving care than that. And so, if she had a hemp rig right now, she'd be fine. And probably not under the kind of tension that the, uh, the polyester or the other modern uh, uh, fibers would uh, create. Newer is not always better. Yeah. No, well, because the the funny thing about the newer materials, they're all they're all trying to find that elusive perfection of the hemp. You know, obviously hemp. The downside is it's weaker. And it rots, yeah. you know. So we now this stuff is stronger and uh, doesn't rot as, uh, you know, it takes a much longer time for it to rot, but um, or be degraded by UV. Um, but it's not doesn't quite have the perfect characteristics that the other had for handling for knot tying, uh, stretch that sort of thing. Um, so we, we still haven't found that perfect line to, to mimic what the old did. Well, I have a bad Kevlar story too. We, we used it for uh, a lifting uh, line on a very large A-frame on the stern of a vessel. The A-frame was 45 foot tall, had a 36 inch pipe cross beam at the top. <clears throat> it had this huge pulley situation up there. And I think we were running probably three inch material and we were doing a 50,000 pound lift just for mm. testing on the deck. And it parted about a foot and a half off the deck. Oh no. It blew paint off the inside of the lazarette. Wow. Um, and what it was, was friction. Kevlar does not like friction and it starts to melt and fuse and starts mm. to weaken. Yes. And when you're running that kind of uh, heavy material, you know, you're going to yeah. get in trouble. Um, so we had to reconfigure and redesign the, the whole system. And it, ultimately it worked, but um, you know, we, we thought we were being smart using this trick stuff and turns out there's some downside to it. Yeah, uh, that's that's the thing. Uh, you really have to be aware of all the um, 
the pros and the cons yeah. of, of, you know, when you're choosing uh, rope um, for its particular job, it, that's, that's very important, knowing the material uh, and what it's capable of, but more importantly, what it's not capable of or what its weaknesses are. Okay, we're going to break right there and save the rest of this discussion, or let's be honest, geeking out, for a second podcast. If you have any questions, comments, feedback, topics you'd like us to cover, or anything else you'd like to share, please shoot an email to podcast at labattleship.com. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T at labattleship.com. As usual, thanks for hanging out with us on Scuttlebutt, and we'll see you next time.